All right, what's up guys? So today I am starting my advanced series and today we'll be going into parametrics. Now, before I go into all that, uh, please give me a like and subscribe if, uh, if you've liked what I've been doing so far and if you've liked any of my previous stuff as well. I'm kind of bad about asking about that. Um, and before I go into parametrics as well, I wanna go into some logistical stuff on what the advanced series is gonna be about. So if you wanna skip all that, I have some timestamps in the description and you can just jump ahead of all that if you don't care. So the advanced series. If you remember my basic, my intermediate, there's series that followed sequentially in that each video would build upon the previous topic. So basic started from not knowing anything to being able to plot and the intermediate was building off of the basic series, but also making code reusable with functions, structs, modules, all that stuff. Now, the advanced series is to cover topics just all over the place now. Each video doesn't really follow sequentially. Right now, this video is going to be on parametrics, but the next video doesn't necessarily build upon parametrics, and it could be something entirely different, which in this case, it is kind of entirely different. That's the goal of the advanced series. At this point, if you've watched the basics and intermediate and you've followed all the stuff in there, you're, you're, you're pretty much a coder. Like you know how to code in Julia, you know the, the ins and outs more or less. This is now going more advanced areas of maybe memory allocation, computer organization, how to make your code more efficient, all those things. So like all the little aspects of how to be a good programmer now, rather than just being a programmer. So with all that covered, let's go into parametrics and let's go what I have here. You can see I have some boilerplate code and that's gonna be another thing with the advanced series is where I'll have code pretty much set up entirely for the most part and I'll be flexing with it a little bit to just show what it does or show how it's different. But for the most part, a lot of this stuff you've already seen before besides the new little thing I'm adding to it. But okay, let's talk about this. You see, I have an abstract type right here. So this is a type right here. We have a struct called ellipse, and we have a, another two structs uh, with a parametric. So this is parametrics right here, which is this brace t1 comma t2. Okay, so we've seen this before. We have a struct and its name is ellipse and it has two field elements and they're both floats. Now. Let's say we wanted to actually make this a bit more general. So if you wanted your ellipse, let's say you wanted the user to be able to define how the field elements work, you would give it a parametric. So that says T. And then you would have A, A, T, B on T, and then end. And this is getting mad because I already have an ellipse. So that's, uh, that's why there's this little wiggly right here, but I'm going to delete this real fast and you can see right there. Okay. And that's pretty much what's going on right here. So that's what this T1, T2 is here and this T for square as well. And I'm going to go into the shape part in a moment, but a parametric, what it does is it allows the user to now define what the field elements are. So here for rectangle, I wanted this to be a float and this to be an int. That's exactly what I did here. I could also change this to be a float as well. And then now everything's a float. I also have to make sure I'm inputting a float or the compiler will get mad. And the same idea for shape. So if you had objects that needed to be more general, let's say you're creating a structure, uh, like similar to an array and you need to be able to take floats and ints and strings and all these different things Then you would want to put a parametric so you don't have to recode it for each different version and Sometimes you don't need a parametric. Let's say you want something that's hard-coded um, What's a specific one Say you're coding a very specific circle? Uh, like the, the unit circle um, So you want it all in radians you want it all uh, around the one unit radius, all that stuff, you want everything hard coded and not to be changed, then you would not want to use a parametric for that. 
probably not the best example, but that's more or less the idea I'm trying to get across. Now, parametrics allow for structs to be a bit more abstract and a bit more general. These types, what they allow is for these structs to, I guess, inherit is the kind of the correct terminology. I say kind of because Julia's uh, polymorphism slash inheritance isn't the best right now. So I, I hesitate to use that word, but it that's what it's doing right here. So let's let's go into the this abstract type shape. So you can see the struct rectangle here. Uh, besides the parametric, it also has this caret colon shape t1, which is essentially saying that rectangle is part of the shape type. And it's the same thing I'm saying right here. So square is part of the shape type. If I wanted to add that for ellipse, I'll do that shape and then type. And this uh, Brace T is just me continuing the parametric because this is defined with, as a parametric with this brace T. I also need to pass along what type it is when I create the, the class. Okay, so why, why do we want to do these abstract types? Well, okay, it also depends on your design. So you can see here I have a function area. Now, depending on how we're coding this out, Maybe we want multiple area functions, or maybe we want one area function that just takes in multiple versions. And that's what this does here now. So this area function takes an S type, which is of sh uh, type shape. And within it, we do some control flow that decides what area formula to perform. So this is a function, this returns true. If, um, it returns true if the shape given is a rectangle. So then it would do the area formula for a rectangle. And if it's not, then it would do the area formula for a square. And if you can imagine, we had tons of other shapes, like circles and rectangles and rhombuses. We can have more control flow, and it would just choose which shape it, you would want. Now, that once again depends on your own design. Maybe you want multiple error area functions because of how you're designing all your different shapes or all your different structs. Maybe you just want one area function and you just want to give it the one shape and it decides within. It really depends on preference. That's that's how this little aspect works. So let's let's look at some of the code here. So you can see I did the area formula for the square and it did five times five. So it did the correct formula for the square itself. And then if I wanted to place to, to an R, run it again, and then you can see the control flow worked and it produced the area for a rectangle. And that's pretty much the main thing with these types and these abstracts, and, or these types and these parametrics. Parametrics allow you to make your structs a bit more general, and types allow a little bit more for some polymorphism, kind of. <laughs> Once again, I hesitate to use that word. But if you're looking for that in your design, this is definitely a way to go about it. And the Julia page goes more into how these abstract types inherit from each other. If you like what I did there so far, please, once again, give me a like and subscribe. And I'll be continuing the next video on to benchmarking. And I hope to see you there.